Good evening, guys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. The Sunday Night Rant, back home. And uh, we're just going to wait for this audience to uh, slowly build up. And uh, hello, Instagram. We're going live on Insta. Hi, Tim. How you going? Hi, Natalie. Ryan Rubenstein. How are you? Curious. Are you related to Gav Rubenstein? Let's get the show on the road. Nick Wallace, good to see you. The Insta crowd's coming in. Hey, Tim, how you going? Mm. Enjoying a pure blonde. Yes, he is related to Gav Rubenstein. The stray whisker, the Buddha is in the details. Good to see you back in the temple. It's good to see you, Connor. I really enjoyed doing the Sunday Night Rant with you last week in Blackheath. For all your shaving needs, look up. Hey, put your link, put your comments in the link, Stray Whisker. Hello, Demi Diamanos, Mykonos 2020. Yes, I can confirm it. In July next year, we will be having a real estate gym session in Mykonos on Greece during the time that people clock off a bit here in Australia and New Zealand. Hey Rob, you did a great job too, my friend, yesterday. I saw you in action there for Ray White in Wetherill Park, I think. So, hey Tanay Jane. Tanay Jane, a big congratulations to Tanay Jane. 100 sales, he hit it. It was also the week that uh, Josh Teslin did 100 sales. It was also the week that Gav Rubenstein had his best month ever in real estate and nothing better than, you know, um, celebrating some wins off my clients. I love it when I see big results like that. So Mykonos 2020. So we're going to go to Mykonos. It's only going to be a one day event, which means that you can go to Europe on business purposes and fly business class if you like and know that you'll be able to get a tax deduction. Check that out with your accountant, but I'm very certain that if you actually attend the event, and I've got to tell you, the Real Estate Gym Mykonos 2020 session will be extremely cheap. Like I'm thinking to myself, less than $200. That's right, less than $200 for that event. Of course, you'll fly there, of course, you'll, uh, organize your accommodation, but we are going to have a group, big group of people. Dates have not been set, but think to yourself around the uh, first, second week of July. That is where it is. Details to come, but uh, so looking forward to it. And whilst we're talking about that, may I also alert you, alert you. We're about to go on to the 12 rules for life, right? We're going to do that. But may I also alert you, we have real estate gym kickstarts, exclusive real estate gym kickstarts across Australia and New Zealand the first week in February. And um, we have speakers lined up, an array of speakers, John McGrath, Lisa Novak, Shari's going to be speaking, Tari Takola, a $1 million female agent from Byron Bay. Kate Smith that does nearly 200 sales a year from Adelaide. Marty Fox, the social media boy from uh, Melbourne. Um, Chris Gilmore that does nearly 160 sales, I think, a year from Brisbane. They are just some of the speakers that are going to be at the Real Estate Gym Kickstarts. And again, there is no selling from the stages. There is no fine line. There's no small lettering. It is $39 because we will continue to deliver the best value training content there is in Australasia. They are $39 for half day sessions with the best of the best. Across Australia and New Zealand, gym members will of course know the date soon when they're emailed out. But guys and girls, Let's get the show on the road. 12 rules for life. So, 12 rules for life. 12 rules for life. Let's begin the show. The 12 rules for life. 
Rule number one, rule number one. This got inspired by me, got inspired by Dr. Jordan Peterson because I love the way that you can actually have one line and that one line you could write a whole book on. It's so powerful that one sentence is able to give you a total philosophy and a total sort of direction towards life. So let's go through the first rule of 12 rules that we're going to go through today. First rule is this one. If you don't want to slip, don't hang around slippery spots. That's the first one. If you don't want to slip, don't hang around slippery spots. Why do I believe that this has been one of my most important laws and rules and guiding principles in my own life? Here's the reason why. Because... Why put yourself in a position where your willpower won't be strong enough? Doesn't it make sense to actually remove yourself from situations that you will be vulnerable? Doesn't it make sense that you will actually put yourself in a situation where it's difficult to actually, you know, it's, it's difficult to not succeed? Or what you're doing is making it very hard for you to fail. And what I'd like to say is, if you don't want to slip, don't hang around slippery spots. What does that mean? What it means is this. You've gone out to the Christmas party. You've had a good time. All the ticks in the boxes have been met. It's a good night. And then all of a sudden, you find that there's only four or five of you that are left and everyone else has sort of gone off. And then you realise... Who are the people that are hanging around at one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning? The late strayers. There is what I mean by hanging around slippery spots. So hypothetically, let's assume that you've got a rule that you don't want to cheat on your partner. And there all of a sudden, it's, you know, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. You're already intoxicated. You then got a couple of other people that apart from alcohol, they've got other substances in their pocket. Next thing you know, before you know it, you've actually slipped. And before you know it, any discipline or willpower you have is gone out the window. So what do I say? If you don't want to slip, don't hang around slippery spots. Doesn't only mean in a situation where I've given you a, a party situation. Think about it in the simple context of if you if 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 chocolate is a weakness and you're trying to you know reduce the amount of sugar that you're having doesn't it make sense you don't have chocolate in your house another example um, um i remember when i was young and for a period of one and a half years when i was around 15 16 I got mixed up with the wrong group of guys from the school that I went to at King Grove North High School. And, um, you know, we'd catch up on a Friday night and we'd go get someone that would buy us liquor and we would drink liquor and um, that liquor would get us, you know, intoxicated. And, you know, you know, that was the first week. The second week, you know, you end up uh, smoking cigarettes after you actually have been drinking. You know, these we're talking about 14, 15 years of age. And then all I remember is like around five or six weeks into hanging out with these guys. They actually pinched a car in Belmore. And I was with them. So what's the long and short of it? Had I actually been with a group of kids that weren't smoking, weren't drinking, weren't out there at nights, you know, thrill seeking, you know, like looking at pinching a car, you would turn around and say that you wouldn't be doing it. But what actually happened is because you're with that group. So what's the secret? You don't hang around slippery slopes. Don't hang around slippery spots and don't hang around with slippery people. Let's move on to number two. Number two. Number two is this. Some of the best gifts in life come badly wrapped. Some of the best gifts in life come badly wrapped. That's rule number two. That's my second rule for life. And what I mean by that, you've heard me use this at a conference, you've heard me use it on a stream, and that is that, you know, a lot of the times in life, when something 
not good happens to us, something that some may have been out of our control, something that you could actually call could be a crisis or a tragedy. Tra- tragedy. You look back, you look back years later and you begin to realize that was a gift that was badly wrapped. You couldn't see it then, but when you look backwards, you could see that it was actually the catalyst. It was actually the change in direction in your life took because that event, the the significance and the strength of that event meant that it woke you up from your coma and from there you actually moved trajectory in your life. So I'm going to say to you guys and girls, sometimes you see this happen with a divorce. So someone gets divorced and they're devastated and he or she end up going into a spiral of depression. Then what happens is you run into this person um, and five years later, they say it's the best thing that ever happened because subsequently they met someone else who was a better partner for them. Subsequently, they ended up having children and subsequently they ended up having a different life they could ever imagine from their first one. Another example happens with a job. You know, I've seen it time and time again where someone got retrenched in some public service job or in the corporate world, they come into real estate and they've got, you know, total control of their destiny. They have got no, you know, having to crawl to their boss because they are the boss. They have freedom. They actually end up loving being outdoors and talking to people and they triple their salary and they realize that sacking, that redundancy, that work termination was in fact a gift that was badly wrapped. In my own life, in my own life, let me just say to you, illness has been a gift that's been badly wrapped. Why? Because illness at an age of, in my mid-30s, woke me up and said, shit, you might need to make a lot of money now because you have to provide for your family because you might not be here. So what do you do? You take risks and you end up working hard because all of a sudden there's a reason why you've got to do it. You don't want them to be selling raffle tickets to be actually providing for food for your family. So what happens? I double down, triple down on work and you know I'm pleased to let you know that I'm today that the way that you know things were supposed to happen and for me I've got to tell you straight Every day since 2006, March, for me, has been a bonus. So I will never get ripped off, no matter what actually happens in my life in the future. I will not get ripped off because the diagnosis I got in 2006 basically meant that any time after that would be a bonus based on the prognosis that I was given. So some of the best gifts in life come badly wrapped. Think about it in your own life. What bad thing has happened that when you look back, in fact, it was a good thing in the way it set up the future life you had? Let's move on to lesson number three. I like this one. Lesson number three. By the way, if you're enjoying this rant, do me a favor and press that share button. Tag someone. So let's move on to lesson number three. Everything works till it doesn't. Everything works till it doesn't. I like this one because a lot of people turn around and say is, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Well, here's the deal. Everything works till it doesn't. And I'm going to give you an example of that. When I was looking after the Wentworth Courier about a decade ago, we were charging $3,750 a page and some weeks we would get 200 pages of real estate in it. And um, I have to say to you um, that people would say, you know, Tom, are you going to innovate the product? Are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? How about bringing some deals out? And what did I used to say? No. Why muck around with it? It's working. But in the meantime, there were clients 
that were getting really pissed off. They were getting pissed off with the lack of flexibility. They were getting pissed off with the high rates. They were getting pissed off with they had no control over certain things. They were getting pissed off because it was just too bloody expensive. But what was happening is they kept buying because they needed it. You know then what happened? Good to see you, Ray from Ireland. Good to see that the message is hitting through in Ireland. You know what then happened? Another product came along at half the price that gave people flexibility. It would come out on the day that they wanted it. It came out from a competitor and then all of a sudden we had to basically radically drop our rates because we were losing all our clients. That's what I mean by everything works till it doesn't. So what you've got to do is you do have to have this slight paranoia, this paranoia that there could be someone in the distance watching the things that you are actually lacking in and they are actually working on a plan to actually attack you. And a lot of successful people have got this paranoia. I'm not saying it's a healthy thing, but it appears to be this paranoia of being concerned that someone could come along doing things different, faster, better, cheaper, and win the market. I have to tell you, when I think about the term, everything works till it doesn't, I think about the real estate agents. I think about the real estate agents who worked in a specific way for 10 years or 20 years, and they were good agents. It worked for them, what they were doing, it worked for them. And then all of a sudden, digital came along. You started getting nice electronic submissions. All of a sudden, you started doing you know, video and social media. But these real estate agents kept saying, hang on a second, but what I'm doing works, so I'll stick to it. And then slowly over time, they began to realize another law, which is this that recency trumps loyalty. That even though they had been established in the market and even though they had a methodology that was working, what happened is that methodology and that process and that way that worked then stopped working. It's like milk and bread. At some point, it serves a purpose. But eventually, then expiry use by date comes along or the best before date shows up and no longer is that relevant. And that's what I mean by everything works till it doesn't. On the one hand, you've got to actually sit there and double down on the stuff that's working for you. And on the other hand, you've got to have another area of your mind which is innovating, which is sort of saying, If I'm not growing, I'm dying. Let's move on. Number four. Nothing breeds failure like success. Nothing breeds failure like success. This is my next rule for life, right? Think about it. The market's great. When the market's great, right? The market's great and everything's selling and there's a lot of stock and it's a great real estate market like it was many, many years ago. High turnover, lots of buyers, everyone's making money. What happens is you stop sharpening the saw, you stop working on your skills, you stop having crucial conversation, you stop looking for new business, you stop doing the things that made you successful in the first place and you became cocky, complacent and arrogant. Then what happens is this, the market changes, it contracts, there's less turnover. Then what actually happens is those that are not skilled, those that have not adjusted, adapted, those who are not doing things differently and better and faster get totally smashed. So what do I say? When you're most successful is when you're most vulnerable because it is seducive. It's seductive. It seduces you and it makes you think that everything is good and it's not you. But let me tell you, a lot of times it is the market. And what actually happens is the market makes you look better than what you are. And it's during these times, it's during these times, I see it all the time in salespeople when they've got a lot of stock and they're feeling bulletproof because they've had a good run. But during this good run, 
they actually stop filling the pipeline of who their next 10 vendors will be. So then they sell the current properties that they had. Hi to everyone that says hello, by the way. Hi to everyone that says hello. And what actually happens is they stop looking for business and there's a law, it's called the law of replacement. And it says, if you are not replacing people in your pipeline, you are going to be losing people that are either buying, that are either moving on, that are either becoming no longer a client. So I say to you guys and girls, never get complacent and never ever get sucked in to thinking you're good and it's not the market. Never underestimate the power of the market. Let's move on to lesson number five. Lesson number five. Ooh, we've still got to go through seven lessons. Lesson number five. Here it is. This too shall pass. This too shall pass. That is my fifth rule in my 12 rules. Why? Because I want you to understand a Buddhist term of impermanence. Impermanence says that nothing ever stays permanent. Everything is always fluid and changing. My nails right now are growing. Tomorrow they will not be like today. Everything is changing. The night, tomorrow will be day. Yesterday it was spring. Today it's summer. In many ways, if you think about it, we are in fact dying all the time. Like a lot of people have this big fear of death. But I do think that if you really think about it, like each day is like a death. That day is gone. Cells in your body are living and dying every day. This process of impermanence is always happening. And I think it helps a lot in life because people get stressed because they can't control things. But you can't control anything because it's not staying static. It's constantly moving. As such is time, as Stephen Vasilevsky is saying, time like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, these are man-made barometers or reference lines. So why do I share this story with you? Because today I visited my mum and she's good most of the times, but today at around six o'clock, she broke down crying about missing my brother. And she's not always like that, but she's sometimes like that. And I'm also sometimes like it. Like yesterday I went to a wedding and I just thought to myself that I was never going to go to my brother's wedding and I just got very sad. But, you know, half an hour later that sadness went. And with my mother there would have been, today I had this, feeling to tell her, you know, mum, snap out of it. Crying's not going to change her. And then I quickly reverted into my mind of this rule that it's not permanent. Like I know tomorrow she's going to be different. So why sit there and get frustrated and anxious of trying to change how someone feels when they're not going to be feeling like that permanently anyway. And, um, Yes, I just think that, I think that this shall also pass is a great rule. Because if you are going through darkness, and if you've had something that has made your life fall apart, something that may have been out of your control, or it may have been in your control, and you screwed up. Let me tell you, the good news is that eventually that suffering will actually go. So you don't have to get too attached to it and too stressed. So that's rule number five. Let's now move to rule number six. And that is, you know what you know, but do you do what you know? I love this rule, particularly as someone that's involved in the business of 
education and personal development and teaching people to become self-reliant. And that is that often I encounter people that say to me, but Tom, I know that. And I always say to them, the better question is, you know what you know, but do you do what you know? It is a far better question. You know what you know, but do you do what you know? And I'll go as far as saying is that knowing how to read and not reading is actually no different to not knowing how to read, if you think about it. I also want to let you know that you know what you know, but do you do what you know is important because it says to me this rule that strategy is for amateurs and execution is for winners. Execution is where the money is. Execution is what separates two people, one that says it and one that does it. Let's move on to rule number seven. Rule number seven has been inspired to me by Warren Buffett, and it is this. People pay a fee, but it is value that they get. I'll say that again. People pay a fee, but it is value that they get. What am I saying by that? What I'm saying by that is this, that someone pays you 1.5% commission to sell their property. So they pay you a commission. But in fact, what they're getting back is value. So think about it. Isn't the best way to get a higher fee or to protect your current fee is to improve the value that you give because then when you correlate the fee, it actually looks, the fee looks super value when you actually provide more value. And using a term that, that Tom Ferry uses, which is stack the cool, stack the cool. How do you actually improve your proposition in the marketplace by adding more value, adding layers of things that you do in addition to what the other competitors do. That's what we mean by being a value added provider. Show more, do more, give more. So that rule also reminds me of the day I did an auction and the auction lasted for one minute. And as I was leaving, the vendor came up. Think about it. It was a one-minute auction. The first bid was a strong bid. And then I just quickly went at 12, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 1.3, 13, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Bang, sold. The owner came up to me as I was getting into my car. And he said, thank you. I noticed this auction only took one minute to do. Do I still pay the $600 in full? And I was shocked. I was shocked. This guy had got like two or 300 over reserve. And his question to me at the end of that auction was it only took a minute. Do I have to pay you the full fee? And I just looked at him and I said, you know that auction that I conducted for you just now? He said, yes. You know that auction that you've clearly stated correctly took one minute? He said, yes. I said, it's taken me 29 years to get it to one minute. That's what we mean by people pay a fee, but it is value that they get. Okay, let's move on to rule number eight. Rule number eight. By the way, guys and girls, if you're enjoying this rant, and as you can see, you're getting the rated PG, which is without the descriptive language. Press that share button. Let's move on to rule number eight. Rule number eight. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. 
Why do I like this rule? Simple. Let's pick that in real estate. One real estate agent that's very average, very average, goes to 100 listing presentations a year because they're a fanatical prospector. They outwork the competition and they spend four hours a day in chasing business and they're incredible at their digital and social media strategy. So they create this attraction marketing coming into them. And because of all of that, they get a hundred presentations to go to, but let's assume that they're a really bad lister. They've got a terrible listing presentation and their conversion rate is only 20%. Let's compare that person to an experienced agent that's got a high EQ, has been in the business for 15 years, but can read the play and can sniff a deal. But this person is lazy. Let's do the numbers. The first agent goes to 100 listing presentations and has only got a 20% conversion rate. He finishes the year with 20 listings. The second agent has a conversion rate of 80%. But because they're lazy and they've got a poor work ethic, they only go to 20 listing opportunities a year, but they've got 80%, so they sign up 16. Do you see the agent that has only got a 20% conversion rate can beat the agent that has got an 80% conversion rate. My friends, that's why I say hustle beats talent when talent won't hustle. That's the reason. That's the law. Let's move on to rule number nine. Rule number nine. Rule number nine is this one. By the way, what you'll notice with these rules, if you put them up on your wall, they become your guiding principles. I could actually write a book out of these rules. Never let perfect get in the way of better. That is rule number nine. Never let perfect get in the way of better. Hey, James Price, we're going to do a video in the next week or two, if time permits, with you, I mean. Uh, never let perfect get in the way of better. What does this say? There's a lot of people that have got paralysis by overanalysis. They don't start because they want everything to be right before they start. Here's the deal. 80% of winning is just beginning. Get started, do something, then you tweak. Then you have a situation that you weren't accounting for, so you tweak again. Then you get a little bit better and you find that this works this way, so you do that. None of that would have occurred if you had never got started. So guys and girls, never let perfect get in the way of better is a good guiding principle to have. Because whether it's your website, whether it's your sales prospecting, whether it's you writing a book, whatever it is in life, if you wait till it's perfect, you may never, ever get started. Let's move on to rule number 10. And this, my friends, is one of my favorites. Rule number 10 is this. Relax. Nothing is in control. I'll say it again. Relax. Nothing is in control. Guys and girls, anxiety is created because you've got a frustration that things aren't the way you want them to be. I'm saying to you, don't worry, relax. Nothing is in control. You don't control so many things in life, yet you stress out. You don't have that much of a big bearing as to how much time you're going to spend on this planet. You don't have that much big bearing on what the weather's going to be like for tomorrow. You don't have that much big bearing on what a competitor is going to say about you. You don't have much you don't have a lot of bearing that someone is going to ring you tomorrow that wants to sell their house because you want them to sell the house. So what do you do? You totally relax because nothing is in control. And you can also um, relax on the, on, the, on, on the issue of even death because the mortality rate between playing safe and risky is the same. It's 100%. 
So what do you do? You play big in your life and you don't stress because you know that most of the stuff that's going on in the world has very little to do with you. So just relax. Number 11. Number 11 is this one. Everything is hard before it's easy. Everything is hard before it's easy. So this basically has been useful for me in the last week, right? So let me tell you what happened with me. So as many of you know, I had to go through um, some sort of treatment to fix something that wasn't right. It got fixed. But in the process of that period, which was you know, well over a year, I ended up being restricted into the kind of activities I could do in sport. So I would just sort of do lift weights and I would do very little cardio. So a week ago, I joined a gym, which is 30 seconds from my home called Orange Theory. And I'm gonna tell you, the first day, it was torture. Like you sort of torch about 800 to 850 calories. I post them up on my Insta stories occasionally when I come out of the class. 800 to 850 calories. It just doesn't, like it's one hour and it just flies through. Like there's about 15 or 20 people in a class and there's a lot of just running. There's just a lot of running, right? And you're constantly trying to get your heart rate to around 80 to 90% of your maximum rate. And you get these things called splats, points, right? So it's a very technology-based gym because they've got, you know, a heart rate monitor that's totally linked to a screen. So you're seeing you're getting biofeedback immediately. But all I can say to you is that I've done five sessions now. And the first one was hard. The second one was hard but a touch easier the third one was bearable the fourth one sort of became like shit i like this and i'm going to tell you i'm sort of hooked but that wouldn't have happened if i hadn't put in my head that the first one to two sessions were going to be hard this applies to push-ups this applies to anything this applies to prospecting Everything is hard before it's easy. This applies to, you know, a newborn coming into your family. It's hard at the start. It gets easier, right? Yes, there's sleep deprivation early on, but then it becomes one of the best gifts in life, mate. So um, that brings us to law number 12. Law number 12. And um, it's this one. Success. Failure happens slowly, then suddenly. I'll say it again. Success and failure happen gradually, then suddenly. What you'll notice is this. Failure, a heart attack. It doesn't happen on the 25th of November. It happened for the 10 years you were having a bacon and egg roll, you were smoking, you were drinking, you weren't exercising, you were a stress head, you weren't getting checked out, and there you go, doof, the heart attack happens. That was happening slowly. Hey Shane, hey Ron, hello, and a hi to everyone. Everything happens slowly, then suddenly. So what does that mean? Stop keeping score each day. Worry about the process and you'll get the results. Guys and girls, that, my friends, was a very enjoyable 45 minutes for me because it was uh, the Tom Panos 12 Rules for Life. And on that note, I want to wish you all the best. I'm letting you know we're doing a major rechange of the real estate gym for 2020. 20 that all is happening at the moment and has been happening for a, for a few months guys and girls i look forward to seeing all you uh, on monday tomorrow i'm going to be with core logic rp data where i'm producing a trusted advisor content course for them on tuesday i'm going to brisbane to uh, support and speak at a conference for uh, violence i think it's against domestic uh, uh, against women, domestic violence, and uh, 
Um, it's an event that I'm um, a, a keynote speaker at. Um, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, um, seeing you all in February at the real estate gyms around the country and New Zealand. And on that point, guys and girls, I'm signing off and thank you with love.